Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Mary Ann Pistana, and today's guest is Tabitha Scott. She's the author of the Silver Nautilus Award winning book, Trust Your Animal Instincts, Recharge Your Life, and Ignite Your Power. And today she's here to talk with us about is intuition really your superpower. Now, Tabitha is an award-winning international advisor, speaker, and best-selling author, a highly credentialed thought leader in electrical and human energy. Her area of expertise is leveraging the principles of energy to lead purposeful transformations. She led efforts in creating the world's largest solar-powered community and was recognized for her groundbreaking smart tech innovations by the White House. Formerly CEO of several successful companies and senior VP of two global organizations, Tabitha currently serves as principal at Southern Growth Studios. So let's welcome to the show, Tabitha Scott. Thank you, Marianne. I am so glad to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about not just your book, but like how can we use intuition in a new way? There are so many ways we can use intuition. You know, um, I talk to companies a lot about how to use it in their strategy to increase innovation and productivity. And we'll talk about billionaires like Oprah and Elon Musk, Richard Branson. You know, they all attribute their success to intuition. Well, do you know, it's, I, I just love your book, which, you know, you, you wrote recently and it received a silver Nautilus award for this year. It's, you know, you trust your animal instincts. Oh my gosh. It's such a great book. What had you decide that, gosh, we need to really look at instincts and how does that relate with animals? Yeah. What, uh, first of all, thank you very much. I was quite honored to receive that award. And it meant a lot to me because I wrote the book to help with positive social change and have spent a career lifetime working in sustainability and things that I feel passionate about. So um, what, what made me choose intuition and animals is when we get in touch with our intuition, it makes for not only good business, like I mentioned briefly there with, you know, giving examples of billionaires, but it, it gives you the ability to connect with the things around you, like nature and animals. And in my book, Trust Your Animal Instincts, I talk about this journey that I went through personally. It went from burnout, uh, leaving this great global corporate job, and going into the jungle uh, for a period of almost three months with no Wi-Fi, no TV or radio on a day-to-day basis. and the more I learned to reconnect, the more things shifted for me emotionally and physically through that process of being reconnected with myself and disconnected from the world of technology and the fast pace of the 24-7 emails and the news cycles and the accelerating change. You know, I figured out that as my vibe was increasing, as it was getting higher through that process, I can connect. I can connect with anything. And so the book talks about a series of animals that I interacted with along that journey. Your journey is so inspiring. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there right now that would like to go to their own Costa Rica. So with everything that's going on right now, we have so many people burnt out, stressed, feeling off balance. You know, I know that you're an energy thought leader How can you describe what's going on now? Yeah, let me say that, first of all, we're all made of energy. Quantum science proves that we are electrical beings. And my energy background is both having certifications in electrical engineering. So I understand how electricity flows and works, but also in human biofield. I have certifications in holistic nursing programs with that. And so understanding how our own bodies and energy fields work, as well as electricity in general. And so that's a really important part of what is happening with us dynamically in the last year or so. 
And let me give you an example from a personal perspective. I hear all the time, you know, Tab, I'm just feeling so off balance and I don't know why, or I feel like I've got this emptiness in my gut. And what that feeling is, is the low vibe around you. High vibes are created by things that are emotions that have high vibrations like love and compassion are two of the highest. Low vibes are caused by things like fear and uncertainty. And my goodness, look at all the pressures from 2020. Um, you know, in, in 2019, the World Health Organization had already classified burnout as a syndrome. And so it was already serious. And then it was worsened by the pandemic and the pressures and the layoffs and everything that happened in 2020. And what that did when it created fear and uncertainty, even if you were isolated in your home, energetically, we're all connected because we all go back to the same source. And when people are feeling those low vibe things, well, it pulls from you. It's the law of, of thermodynamics. You know, it's one of those laws where if you put an ice cube in a bathtub, it's going to dissipate. And so our energy works that way as well. And if you don't protect yourself energetically, it will pull from you. It's like, you know, those people that when you're around them, they're a big energy suck, like a vampire. Mm -hmm. And you feel that, you know, you have been brought down. Well, you have. And so there are techniques in the book where I talk about protecting yourself. You know, when, when COVID first started, and I worked with some local ER physicians here in Nashville about how to protect themselves energetically from COVID. And that may sound a little crazy, but if you think of the world in terms of being waves and frequencies, they were taking on even more mania than usual. And so I talked to them about putting up a shield, an invisible shield around themselves and allowing that stress, allowing those low vibe things to just go around them. And, you know, being careful, don't put up a barrier. The book also talks about this. When bad things happen to us, a lot of times we build barriers. And the difference with that is, you know, that's a permanent structure. So you can't get your love out. You can't accept in love and, and the high vibe things that you need to receive to stay recharged if you have that barrier up. And so it's really important to do a shield. You know, when we go into battle, Warriors, you know, they don't take something permanent with them. It takes too much time. They just carry a shield. And it's the same with our energy and protecting that. It's like if you see someone coming at you with a bat or a weapon of some sort, you run away. You know, you have fear. You, you realize that there's a threat. But the challenge in America today is we don't, uh, we've lost that sense that the Native Americans had that they still have in the Far East, that energy is just as real. Um, it is as real as the physical threats. And so when you have these things happening, like um, someone has a low vibe around you, or there's a lot of uncertainty, that is every bit is real and you can feel it. You can feel off balance and you hear it in our language. Wow, she just wiped me out. Or I am so off balance. I just can't get in sync. You know, our language is full of energy euphemisms and references. And so we have to start realizing that energetic attacks are every bit as powerful as physical attacks. And sometimes more so because you can't see them. And it's, it's more difficult to deal with until you get into your intuition, like you were saying in the beginning, until you reconnect to that. And then it becomes easier and easier with practice over time. I've heard of some hospitals that are training their physicians in different forms of energy healing. And I believe that science has really come together to this point where it's incorporating energy medicine practices to treat the whole body, not just symptoms. They're treating the mind, body, and spirit. It really does. And there's this great book, Molecules of Emotion, that ties it to science and how emotion is the root of our physical manifestation. And I took in my book, the approach of physics and mathematics and energy electricity to explain how, um, you know, I was raised in a way that 
it was kind of like there was spirituality over here and the Bible. And then on the other hand, there's science and never the two shall meet. And guess what? The more I learned about physics, the more I learned about quantum science, science totally reinforces what we were taught, you know, and um, our, our other practices and spirituality. It's not either or, it's both. You know, that's very interesting. A lot of times it seems that belief systems tend to get so wrapped up and you hear people say that they can't believe in intuition because of their religious background. It just doesn't allow for that. How does somebody navigate that or reconcile that? Yeah, it's not easy at the beginning. You know, I call myself a recovering logical person because I've spent a career, you know, speaking at uh, business conferences and to tech technology leaders and at universities or or C-suite professionals. And what it, it took for me was uh, a lot of guts to put out there, hey, you know, I'm getting messages from animals. Um, I understand, you know, what what nature is telling me. And I'm tapping into this intuition from beyond in a way that I have never done before. Um, so it, it is, seems very out of sorts at first for people who have trained themselves out of it. But once you find that intuition again, and some people can sit down and do meditation and they're very successful with that. But you know what? I'm more like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs as far as being busy into a million things and my mind works like that. And so for me, it's about getting into nature or going for a long run. And what I learned is it's all about getting yourself in a high vibe state. It's all that energetic high frequency. And if you think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the self-actualization, the top parts of that are high vibe things. The bottom of that triangle, the safety of food, you know, uh, what we need for survival, those are things that are low vibe things. And so psychologically, physically, energetically, it always comes back to your vibe, to your energy and what energizes you. And it could be as a person, it could be as an organization, what makes some organizations great and powerful and catchy and people want to work for them. And, you know, what makes people a light in the world. And it's really interesting. If you look at different religions, like the Bible, for example, it references um, God as the light 272 times in the King James Version. So, you know, there's a lot to this that we are energetic beings. And if we can control our energy, if we figure out what really powers us, then we had the potential to do so much more for ourselves and our families and our work. You know, I was really interested in how you describe this level of awareness. It, it seems like it's a really deep connection and being so aware and mindful and present in the moment. And you hear that top business leaders cultivate this skill set. I can understand why it's something that in business we really need to kind of hone in on. It absolutely is. And, you know, if you're going to achieve that kind of wellness and balance, do the things that you love and stop stressing yourself out about, I've got to figure out the purpose for my entire life right now. Let me give you an example. In the old days, corporate strategy was about, I'm going to do these things over the next three years. And then your monthly meetings, it was this linear path and your monthly meetings we're discussing, hey, where is our budget varying from that? What has happened this month that's taken us off this linear path? And so it was all about course correcting to somewhere you knew you already wanted to go. Well, guess what? That went out the window when our pace of technology today is the same as in the year 2000, the entire year of technology is now replicated every 30 seconds. So that's math that makes my head explode and we're living it. And so there's no way you can have a linear path for three years anymore, much less, you know, to tomorrow at lunchtime. And so everything is constantly variable and getting in touch with that intuition 
being totally connected to where you are, what vibes you're feeling is critical. It's like if you're driving on cruise control on a trip, you know, you're going someplace and you lose track of the things you see along the way. You know, maybe you plug in a um, a book to listen to. Maybe you're doing something else, but you're not noticing what's going on around you. And long-term planning is kind of like that, both personally and at work. But if we're in touch with what's going on every minute, if we're listening to that intuition, um, does this exit have a sign that is is you know really sticking out to me? Is there something I notice about um, the things that I'm passing on the road that makes me want to stop? If you're listening to it, then the world will open up to you. And in business, as I said, you know, Oprah, Elon Musk, these people attribute their success to listening to that voice inside. And the way you hear it, you hear it by doing the things that feel good for a waypoint. So in my cruise control methodology, you may not know where you want to go, you know, for your dream vacation, or if you just get in the car and you don't know where that perfect destination is, you may never get to perfect, but pick waypoints, pick little things along the way that make you feel good. What, what does that look like? That means if you're at work, you know, 85% of Americans are unhappy in their jobs right now. And if you're unhappy at work, find the things that you are happy doing. You might not be happy um, doing the bookkeeping, but whenever you're mentoring the young lady that sits across from you, that really pumps you up. So maybe you can ask, hey, could I start a mentoring program? Find ways and take the risk to ask for those little nuggets that you do feel good about. And what that does is it raises your vibe. And the more you do of those over time, and the more you can shed the things that you don't enjoy doing, that is how you get to fulfillment. That's how you get to a high vibe state where you can keep up with that pace of change. It's no longer linear. It's more like chaos theory math now, as far as trying to map out our future. But guess what? You can keep up with it. If, if the only thing you're focused on is following, how do I feel in this moment? If it's good, do more of that. If it's bad, stop doing that. Well, that's an easy barometer to see how you're feeling at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and to dovetail on this, I know you work with so many people and leaders and corporations. What is the number one thing, or maybe two things, that you see people really get stuck in? I think there's um, there's actually two things, if I may, that that really get people stuck. Probably the first is the should monster, what I call the should monster. People just need to stop shooting on themselves. You know, they could reduce their stress. They can avoid burnout. If they identify those things that are making them feel stressed out and disconnected or negative, um, as I was just saying with tuning into your vibe and strip off those things that don't serve you, that is what I'm talking about. You've got to let them go. When I was asking the universe. And I was actually speaking to my grandmother who passed when I was 16 and we were so close growing up. Um, you know, grandma drove this green little Vega car and she always drove really fast, which was very exciting. And she was about four foot 11 and 220 pounds. So she kind of looked like this adorable cabbage patch, um, doll. And we had so much fun at her house and I was speaking to her asking, what should I do? I'm, I'm miserable in the job I'm in. I had been doing renewable energy, some major projects in net zero communities and working in it for 17 years. And I just felt like people didn't care about the environment in a lot of areas of the United States. And um, it was so disheartening. And I reached such a point of burnout with various stresses going on in my personal life and my work life, that I was like, Grandma, what, what should I do? And I kept seeing snakes and I didn't put it together. It took many months of seeing snakes everywhere. I saw them near my house. I saw them hiking. I saw them cycling down the road. I would have to stop and let them pass. And it was just this weird thing. So 
I talked to everyone from pastors. I was Googling examples. My friends were making fun of me and uh, talked to energy shaman people. Nobody had an answer that made sense. And finally, one day I got so frustrated. I'm like, could I just please get a billboard? Just give me a sign of what to do. I'm so burnt out. I just, I'm so frustrated. What are all these snakes about? And here came another snake. And I saw, it was like a flash of light, shed your skin. And I got goosebumps head to toe. And I looked up, what does, why do snakes shed their skin? Well, they shed it for two reasons. First of all, because if they don't get rid of it, it holds them back. They can't grow into the powerful creature they are supposed to be unless they let it go, shed it. The other reason they shed their skin is because it gets it gets um, parasites in it. And I thought, oh my goodness, how many parasites have I let into my life? Unhealthy relationships, people that didn't have my best interest in mind. My job, you know, some of the things that were going in, on in my life totally resonated with that message. And so that was the catalyst that said, quit your, quit your job. Um, I put my house on the market. I changed my name back to my maiden name. You know, I made these major life moves that I had been thinking on for a long time. And I just said, forget it. Stop shooting on myself. You know, I don't have to be this executive person forever. It's okay if I get divorced, life will continue. You know, I had put so much stress on myself and I was just shooting all over myself. So shedding your skin, let go of it is the number one thing um, that people do. And they do it in business. They do it at home. They fall in love with ideas that don't work and they can't shed them. So the faster you can get rid of the things that are pulling you down, the easier it will be to move forward. Well, I have to say better snakes than bears, you know, (laughs) (laughs) definitely, definitely. And, and, you know, mm -hmm, go ahead. The second, the second thing that I see all the time, especially in women at work is they don't take the risk. They don't embrace change by taking the risk to get what they want. You know, change is never easy. But if you're listening to your intuition and you know that you want something, ask for it. You know, I never got, I've been CEO of companies. I've been SVP of a couple of global companies. And you know what? I never had a title like that. I never had one of these big roles without writing out the job description and asking for it. And sometimes people are very comfortable doing that. Most of the time people are not. They want to wait for people to notice them and reward them. But I have news for you. Back to this, you know, 24 7 accelerated speed on everything. Nobody is thinking about your career and your fulfillment and happiness as much as you are going to be. And so you have to take that risk and step out and be willing to ask for what you want at work, at home, you know, in your community. And one of the lessons that I learned in in the book. I used to do yoga every day while I was in Costa Rica and it was really hot there. I had this giant banyan tree that I would stand on this little covered thatch area in front of it. And um, these bats started to alight, you know, around me whenever I would do yoga, they would come and they would clerk, they would chirp and they would cluck and they would make these weird sounds. And, um, you know, I didn't feel threatened in any way. And I named them after the seven dwarfs. And um, I was like, what is the lesson I am to learn from these bats? And so I'm upside down and this way and that way doing my own improvised set of yoga. And thankfully, nobody was watching. It was only the bats. And uh, what I learned from them is, you know what? A bat cannot fly unless he lets go. That's why they hang upside down. Because if he tries to take off from the ground, he can't go. But guess what? If he takes the risk, if he lets go, if he risks dropping to his death to the ground, he can fly where he can get his nourishment, where he can, uh, you know, be who he's supposed to be. But until he's willing to take that risk, he'll never know how to fly. 
That's just so impressive when you look at that, just how these animals and just being aware of your surroundings and what is coming up, how that gives you markers like in your road saying, hey, pay attention to this, or maybe you should pay attention to that. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't have to be something scary or exotic um, in an animal. It could be your own dog or cat that you have at home. When I started thinking about my connection to animals, I thought about a horse I had growing up and we had chickens. I taught them to shake hands. We had you know dogs and cats and all sorts of things. And um, it's that feeling you have when you're walking with your dog, when you forget what time it is, or you forget to come in for dinner. And what are the things you're doing? Maybe it is animals that have that connection for you, or maybe it's hiking in the woods and in nature. You know, psychology proves that being in nature for 90 minutes, even if you're watching a video on television of nature, it's proven that it will reset your mind in a more positive, high vibe state. So what are some techniques that people can use to kind of stay in that high vibe state? I think the most important thing that you can do is to follow what makes you feel a little better. So we talked about that already. If you love um, hiking, cycling, playing an instrument, petting your dog, whatever makes you feel a little happier, You're, you don't have to be totally fulfilled and blissful like a, a yogi. You just have to feel a little better and that will incrementally raise your vibe. So first is following that proactively then protect it is really important. And there's the technique of the shield, like I talked about earlier, but there's also techniques. Let's talk about in business, for example. If someone comes at you with a, um, an attack or you know they're strongly disagreeing with you in an important meeting or in an important setting, your tendency by nature is to defend yourself, you know, to, to pipe back at them. And what that does, you know, it's, it's one of the old Newtonian laws of physics, you get an equal and opposite reaction and your energy cancels each other out. And so to stay high vibe, you redirect their energy. And I, I call it, you know, energetic judo because you're using their energy against them. So let me give you an example about, um, I'll use a business example this time. When I was working with renewable energy, a very wise colleague of mine, uh, Richard Lucy, he said, you know, Tab, you can't get at the environment in a way that's going to ostracize other people, because by doing that, you're just going to cancel each other out. So don't say I'm going to replace coal. Coal is bad because you just immediately start, um, you know, this back and forth. Instead, find something that's positive for everyone that helps everyone win. And what does everybody in America like? Money. Companies like making money. And so we found these business economic models that made solar feasible. And we were working with 40,000 military homes across um, the United States. And we said, what if we find a way to do a separate investment, a business model where we could make even more money and help the people in the homes with their energy costs and, you know, help the environment. It's a win, win, win all the way around. And that's how we ended up with two net zero communities, the world's largest solar array. It was because we were thinking of positive direction that everybody could get behind. And that's a different dynamic. If an object's already in motion and you accelerate it, it all goes faster. Where if you're spending your time and energy saying, you know, save the world, it's dying. Now you've put something negative out there and you're, you know, fighting this battle of back and forth and canceling each other out. So when you view the world through this energist lens, when you view the world as it is vibrating energy, then you can direct your ideas, you can implement things that are beneficial for everyone, and use a little energy judo yourself. I love that because it really puts a person in this, you know, place of great responsibility for themselves and their energy and the world around them, you know, instead of kind of being a victim, like life is happening to me, you know, I'm creating life instead. 
you know, I'm creating the world around me. And I think it opens up so many possibilities when we live in that kind of state. It absolutely does. And, you know, it works in your personal life too. I had a a neighbor friend who, you know, our kids went to school together and I had a work event one day. So I missed the school trip to the Capitol and I hadn't committed to go or, you know, even discussed it, but on social media for all the world to see, you know, she posts, well, you missed the field trip today. And, you know, it was like this attack. And immediately I thought, oh, I'm embarrassed. All my friends are going to think I don't care about my child. You know, all of these things are racing in my mind and you immediately want to fire back. How dare you say that? And especially on social media, what's up? And instead I took a few deep breaths and I did a judo move and replied, you know what? Um, We are all so interested in having the best field trips for our kids at school. It's really important that parents are as involved as they can be in communicating. Do you have some suggestions on a way that we could, um, you know, make sure that these are powerful in the future? So by asking a question, I just judoed that energy right off the rails. You know, it wasn't coming at me anymore. And her reply back was, I'm going to set up a face group, um, a Facebook group right now where we can, you know, talk to each other and plan our field trips together. So, you know, here's this positive outcome that comes out from a negative strike to begin with, because I moved out of the way and redirected that energy back to her, giving her the chance to, you know, say something positive. And you know what, when you ask a question and it redirects their energy, this works in business all the time, by the way. If you can't think of what to say, ask a question back, ask them for their opinion, because it shifts their energy into a different part of their brain. And in a worst case scenario, even if they keep railing or or keep complaining, it gives you some time to think about your next move. Well, that I, I just love that because it really is changing the energy and looking at things with a different perspective. You know, a lot of times people look at that and get really defensive. You talked about building walls and that really kind of stops us from being able to have deep connections with other people. It so does. And if you look at our geopolitical situations, at our social situations and the places where we are most polarized, that is the energy dynamic that is happening. It is this group saying, I am right. And that group saying, I am right. And it makes me think of that cartoon where you have um, two guys, one on each side facing each other. And one of them sees the number six on the ground. And one of them sees the number nine on the ground. And they are both absolutely right. And so it's realizing we can both be right. We both have unique sets of paradigms and perspectives shaped by, you know, how we were raised, where we were born, what types of things we have done throughout our lives. And so it's realizing it's not about arguing because you are both right. Forget it. Like you're wasting your energy. Find that common ground. Both of them could say, Hey, I see a number and it's bigger than five, you know, (laughs) and focus on that. And when you can start to see this energetic coming together and this dynamic of people working together to find the positive things that they do have in common, guess what? Things will really start to transform for us. We're going to start having purposeful transformations. And that's where I think the future of work is. I think it's the positive change that is going to drive sustainable results, um, not just for short-term market signals, but for long-term sustainable profitability. And that goes for people too. You know, if we're being purposeful about our transformations, then our lives are going to be a lot more fulfilled. My goodness. You know, I just really appreciate how that all comes together. And, you know, you're just the right person to write this book. I mean, not all of us can go and spend time in a jungle in Costa Rica. (laughs) Nor would you want to. (laughs) I am not I probably would, but I'm not sure about other people. You know, but the thing is is that you know you got to this point where you're on kind of this personal, really inward mission, you know, for yourself. 
in Costa Rica, you have this amazing background. At what point did all this start to kind of dovetail together? Yeah, I think there was this point where I was actually in, um, I was running on this trail in, in the Costa Rican jungle and it's a hundred degrees there and it's super dry and hot. And it occurred to me then to write the book. This was after two months of the self-imposed isolation that I had from the modern world. And I had done the night before this ancient samurai warrior technique. And that's another energetic technique that I teach people how to do for themselves. It goes like this. You imagine the worst possible thing that happens if you take a risk. The samurai warriors would imagine their death before they go into battle. So their head could be in the game the whole time. They weren't worried about getting killed because they left that behind. They had already shed that. And it works the same with us energetically. So I literally journaled that night. Okay, I'm going to die tonight. Here's what's going to happen. You know, um, the property manager will eventually find me. You know, they'll call so-and-so back home. And, you know, so I walked through that the night before and I'm in the jungle. I'm running exhausted and tired. And I reached this emotional tipping point where I felt completely connected and hyper aware of the nature of the animals around me and myself. And my book talks about this interaction with an alpha howler monkey. And if you know anything about monkeys, these are the biggest, the largest monkeys um, on this side of the world. And they have this obnoxious howl. It kind of sounds like a lion roaring. It's pretty scary, but um, they're not necessarily dangerous, but they will throw their poo at you if they don't like you or (laughs) if you startle them. Oh boy. You have to be careful. (laughs) And I uh, made friends with the alpha of this tribe in the jungle where I would do, you know, runs. And um, sometimes he would literally cry with me. He ended up doing things like um, one time he took a shirt that I had tied to a tree and he took it up in the jungle, you know, off the trail. Um, it was just really interactive things that I couldn't explain. And I, I reached this emotional tipping point where it had taken weeks of studying and, um, you know, shedding the things that had bothered me to get to that point. But that was the point um, that I knew I had to get this message out there. And after that, it took, you know, a very, very long time um, to get that articulated in a way that anyone could understand it. And what I did is I I left this barrage of, of should monster shoulds on the floor of that jungle, you know, next to those dried up leaves on the floor of the jungle. And they were things like, you should be able to heal your son's disorder. One of my sons has narcolepsy and I can't help him. I've done everything I could, but it it was just tearing me up. I couldn't help him. You should have a perfect marriage. You know, you should be able to save the environment. You should fit in with the other moms. And at that moment, I realized, you know what, we are born fully free all of us are born free and we allow ourselves to conform over time. We are all inextricably woven from this same energy and it allows us to be reborn throughout the ages. So here I am having this epiphany in the middle of the jungle with this crazy monkey. And, uh, you know, I realized this is the energy source behind all religions, you know, self-help books, business methodologies. It's the same energy. And it just clicked that, there was more power inside of me than I could ever have imagined. And my next thought was everybody has this ability to reconnect. Everybody does. And I had this passion to share it. What I learned the hard way, which is that one energy source creates all life, controls our emotions, empowers our communities. And so I wrote this book that anyone can recharge their own life and ignite their own power. Well, there are so many people right now looking to do that and kind of rediscover what makes them happy. I mean, we're in this you know time of great possibilities, I feel. For so many people, they can choose different jobs. They can, you know, look at different ways of working. There's so much that's there. And I know that you talk about intelligent intuition, and I really feel like people right now 
are looking at intuition in their business life and personal life in complete different ways. What does intelligent intuition mean? I think intelligent intuition is getting in touch with your passion, with a purpose, with what is driving you and actually listening to it and following it. And as I mentioned earlier, I I see purposeful transformation as the future of work. That's where companies that are successful, like um, Patagonia, you know, realizing that fair trade and, and local labor or Ben and Jerry's with their work for, um, you know, inmate introduction to the workplace. Those are very profitable companies, but it's positive change that drives sustainable results, not just short-term market signals or short-term, you know, feel good things that we do for ourselves. That donut is going to feel really good short-term, but if you make a habit out of it, it's not going to be sustainable and healthy. And I think we know every company is is changing and transforming and CEOs are, agree this pace of change is accelerating by the minute. But smart leaders also realize people are transforming too. And I think that's where companies lose sight and they lose the connection. And that's why 85% of Americans are unhappy in their jobs because success is no longer defined by dollars alone. It's been reimagined as part of something much, much bigger and something meaningful. And the future of work, I think, is going to be led by organizations that understand and embrace this this tectonic shift from requiring conformity for profits to embracing creativity for purpose. I completely agree with you. So do you feel that businesses that reimagine the workplace in a whole new light, just totally different way, are those the businesses that we'll see excelling in the future? Yeah, I think you're so right. And and these recent events, you know, we already had a skewed work-life balance before with the pace of change and everything else. And then you add to that unexpected cuts and layoffs, and that just further fueled our apprehension and brought our vibe down further. And whether these workers were feeling like an unappreciated cog in a money machine or they were living in fear of losing predictable income. I mean, I've been there myself, feeling both of those things. You know, it's the steady drumbeat of anxiety, and it goes beyond burnout. Um, I was talking to a friend the other day, and I half was teasing. I said, I think I have corporate PTSD. And um, I Googled it, and it's a thing. Like, today's employees are experiencing this emerging crisis of corporate traumatic stress disorder. Check it out. Because it describes how it's it's negatively impacting our innovation, productivity, and personal interactions. There was a study that just came out from U.S. CEOs. And one of the top things on CEOs' minds today is that they need more you know, from fewer people. Well, the only way to do that is to let them raise their vibe, to realize that if it's not, if you're not helping your team your employees with their own purposeful transformation and positive change, then you're not going to have change that means anything. You're going to miss out on the fulfillment, the empowerment, and the happiness at work. And so looking at those companies that are doing it right, like Patagonia or Ben and & Jerry's, and, and there's a number of them, uh, studies show that more sustainable companies are more profitable. And that's why so many are starting to get on the bandwagon now. But uh, it's really important to figure out what drives team members and then how to make sure that they're in the right place so that they are energized by what they're doing. One of the tools that um, I use in business a lot, it's called the AIM Cube tool, and it's, it was founded in the EU, but it's based on movement. So it's less about psychology and more about ontology. What energizes people? How do they get into action? And it maps people and teams against a S curve or a growth curve. And what we learned from that is, you know, if you have a team and they are all at the bottom of the curve and you need people that are um, at the top of the curve, like um, the bottom of the curve are startup people. You know, they love new ideas in the startup and they live in the future. The top of the curve are people that are protectors. And so those are people like 
auditors or attorneys, you know, guardians, safeguarding things. And if you have a team that is skewed with one or the other, then your team is not going to be optimal performance. And it's just like if you have an electrical circuit and you're trying to get as much power to as many homes as possible, but you have, you know, only power flowing to a certain group of homes, the the community is not going to be lit overall. So it's making sure you have power in every part of that S-curve, every part of the organization, because whether you're talking about the growth cycle for businesses, for plants, for animals, for humans, every living thing follows that same growth cycle, because guess what? It's a wave, it's movement, and it goes back to, you know, we're all just energy. So if you figure out your energy, you figure out yourself and you figure out your business. Do you think that people are really viewing energy in a whole new way, especially when it comes to success? I absolutely do. And it's interesting. Um, there's a, a gentleman I met this spring and I ended up going to work with him. He's um, one of the smartest brilliant minds that I've met, Michael Graber in Memphis, Tennessee. And he is the one that um, first introduced me to the language of purposeful transformation. And it just clicked for me in so many levels. Um, If I had thought of that, maybe I would have put it in my book title long ago, but it's, it's what I've been doing about the energy, the potential energy of people, the potential energy of companies, and you know, quite literally the electricity that we're powering. And um, so Michael is one of those thought leaders that works with a lot of large companies and um, helps them with innovation and to see what's coming next. So I think companies that are thinking about those things are being more successful. And you're seeing more of these consulting firms like the one he has, uh, which he calls the studio because he doesn't like the word consultant. Um, But you're finding these anti, you know, tradition groups that are taking companies and reshaping them um, so that they can be that agile company that they need to be to respond to the chaos that's around us. So I'm seeing it happen. I think we're at the beginning of this mega trend of it happening everywhere. And, you know, we've seen it for years in Silicon Valley where they're competing for the top talent. They've been offering them places to meditate and, you know, yoga classes and things for many years. But the rest of the world and the rest of the corporate world is catching up. You see so many corporations getting on board with mindfulness, meditation, and of course, mental health. I mean, that's so important. And thank goodness we're at this point in history where that's happening. It's so true. And, you know, having these little meditations or little mantras, something that can bring you back to center and recharge yourself again. Um, Just thinking about what makes you happy, even it's, and it's funny, you can, you can also do it with posing your body in certain ways. There are, there's a lot of information on power posing, or, you know, you could put a pencil between your teeth and it forces your face into a smile and you'll start to feel better. So um, you can change your energetic state by putting a pencil between your teeth. Now, whoever thought of that, right? (laughs) Who would, you never know what's going to come out of my mouth next. You really don't. (laughs) Well, I I really appreciate, I mean, because you just, you really deliver some honest, (laughs) unique wisdom and perspectives that I think are so helpful for today's, you know, not just society, but, you know, just our world at large. And I really appreciate the insight that you bring. What would be one thing you want people to walk away with? I think if I want them to walk away with one thing, it's, you know, above all else, practice love. And that might sound um, a little cheeky or cliche, but, you know, love is among the highest vibrational activities. And so the act of giving it away actually makes you happier and more connected and balanced. I say it's like, a magic penny, like the more you spend it, the more you get back. Um, So think about it in that way and find ways to love the people in the situations that you dislike, because it gives you more creativity. It's going to reduce your stress and it's going to help you stay more mindful. And what that does, if you can find a way to let go of the negativity, 
to practice love, now your mind is free. Your mind is free from the worry, from the stress, from the distractions, and you can tap into your own potential. You can be more powerful at home, at work, practice love. It's the easiest thing that everybody knows how to do. And um, it will help you to be more successful. Well, Tabitha, congratulations for your Silver Nautilus Award for your book, Trust Your Animal Instincts. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? They can check out my website. It's powering-potential.com. Don't forget the dash between powering and potential. Well, Tabitha, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much, Tabitha. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And to talk about is your intuition, your superpower. Before we go, just a reminder, you've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.